Think about the economics of sampling, like a recording, uh, you know, who gets paid from it, whoever, you know, whoever wrote the song that got sampled and whoever owns the copyright on the sound recording. Now the thing is with like the funky drummer, Clyde Stubblefield got paid that day, although he came up with the drum, the drum pattern, and that was the basis of the song. Um, the uh, author by law, the legal author who owned the sound recording, and the publishing on it, I believe, you know, is James Brown. Um, he took authorial credit, so him and his estate got paid for any sample clearances of that song. A session musician is someone who's, who's a work made for hire. They're paid for a day or two days uh, in, the, in the recording studio, a flat amount. They do not get royalties. They do not get authorial credit. They do not get publishing. Um, you know, they're, they're hired as a laborer, a mu musical laborer. Okay, so that's why Clyde never got paid for that because he's not the author by law. Okay, and um, you know, it's just kind of a, a bummer, you know. Um, and that drum break, it's just dope, you know. Um, so many people used it, it's been used so much, um, it's been looped because the way that Clyde played, I mean, he's the funky drummer, yo, like he is, and like he just. The way that he, he had the crazy swing to his drums and he just played stuff really loose but tight. It's really so hard to explain. Um, the, 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 the tempo of the break, you know, around 99 beats per minute and again, manipulated faster, pitched, you know, slowed, slowed and, and sped up, you know. Just the sound of it. It's just dope. I've used it a bunch and just looped it. I've chopped it up. Um, I've replayed other people's drums to sound like the funky drummer, you know. Um, you know, copyright law is so dated. In the United States, you know, our current law is from 1976. Just think about that, right? It predates sampling technology. It's in the middle of hip hop, but hip hop wasn't even noticed. It was still, you know, merry-go-round and quick mix theory at that point in the mid 70s. The laws do not acknowledge it in any way, but you know, the, the adaptation is legal precedence, right? And that became Bismarcky, you know, who they threatened to put fucking Bismarcky, Yo Gabba Gabba Bismarcky, you know, in jail um, for, for sampling. And that's why that case is so important is because it established that you need to clear your samples. There's a common misnomer out there that if you use 10 seconds of a sound recording, it's, it's, it's small enough, you know, that, 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 that's a, that's a tale, you know, that's a myth. Um, you use one second, it's in, if you read the Jay-Z versus the Sample Troll in the Bridgeport decision uh, in 2004, that ruled essentially that like, you use any small bit of a sound recording and it's, it's copyright infringement. Um, you know, but the De La Soul case was the first one that, that got sampling notice, right? The Turtles noticed that they sampled their loop and they went after it. They went after him. They settled out of court, and then Bismarcky was was shortly there thereafter, um, and that set the precedent that you need to clear your samples or should cl clear your samples because you may get tossed in jail. You know, um, the re record label is going to lose a bunch of money. So after that, you start to have people clearing, and then you start to look at uh, the back of records and liner notes and stuff like that, and it will list out the samples. Like I was reading off of like the, some of the samples on the uh, Tribe Called Quest Midnight Marauders. Type, type stuff um, and here's the deal you know is like how did these lawsuits how did it change sampling well it goes back to the, the the two different types right the lazy loop take something hot and try to make it hotter you know uh, MC Hammer ice 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 cube I mean ice cube uh, vanilla ice um, you know uh, 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 Stevie Wonder and uh, Coolio type stuff um, we, you know, you take something that's awesome and make it maybe a little awesomer and then the LP, like change it, you know, change it up so people can't recognize it. And really what was a press, you know, the, how people sampled a lot up until the Bismarck key case is they looped, they layered, a, they looped up drums and then they looped up some melodies you know, um, and then they threw in some James Brown, James Brown, uh -huh, or yeah, you know, or whatever. Um, and they'd stab those in, but they were looping stuff and layering loops. Um, after that, that lawsuit, people started chopping. And we'll talk more about that in our next class when we talk about Paul C., Pete Rock, 
uh, and large professor and talk about sampling technique, but you know, basically producers started chopping their samples. So they'd find a loop and they'd break it down into, into notes. So they'd break it down into two note sections. They'd just break it down and then they'd replay it in different ways. And then they'd process it. They'd filter out the lows, you know, the bass, or they'd filter out the treble, um, or they'd reverse it, or they'd do all of the above. Um, and they'd play it in ways where it, wasn't where it wasn't recognizable, you know, because you didn't want people to know your records, you know, what you were sampling. You wanted it to, you wanted to flip it, you know, you wanted to have it be original and be your own. And the Coolio style, you know, MC Hammer style is not original. It's not your own because you're not doing much to it, you know. Um, so it changed, like people reacted to the law by like changing how they made beats. They started just chopping shit up and manipulating it uh, so they didn't get caught. So they didn't have to pay, so that they didn't have to clear it. And sometimes they still had to clear it, you know, it depends on your, your record label. Um, but I mean, and that, that kind of set like a cultural precedent, like, yo, you need, to, you need to change your samples. You need to fucking flip them. You need to chop them up and beat them up a little bit. Um, and put them back in a truly new way and not just loop them up. So the law had a big impact too on beat making uh, technique in the late 80s, you know, which really went on to influence the early 90s where chopping was like, that was it, you chopped your shit up, you know, you, you flipped your shit, you know. Um, anyway, so I think the film does a pretty good job of showing why people sample, you know, probably less about like why it's not cool, but you get the general sense, right? It's lazy, you're, you, you know, you're not a musician. Uh, the sampler's not a musical instrument, right? Like what you're doing is not creative, it's not original. And you know, to me that's all bullshit, you know? Um, because again, like, you know, it's just a perception, you know? And again, like more and more and more trained musician types, you know, our sampling and starting to realize like, yo, it's like an effective tool for creating, for creating music. It's just how you use the instrument, just like you can use a guitar or a piano or keyboard to replay someone's song, or do, but you can do a funky arrangement of it, or you can just take little bits and pieces of it and incorporate it into your new, your new, your new song um, without sampling, but just playing keys or a guitar. So, um, you know, it's taking time. I think more and more people are starting to recognize it as as creative, as an instrument, um, and 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 recognize the capacity of it. Because you can do so much with like a sampler or with turntables as a DJ that you can't do as a musician. Um, and it's mad and fucking empowering, you know, to being able to touch sound and manipulate. I'm telling you, in just a, a way that's so different. Um, and, and and unless you've done it, it's really it's really hard to understand. You know. Um, how that feels and why that, I don't know why that's a dope feeling. So anyways, uh, stay tuned. Um, we'll come back in the next, uh, the next unit. We're going to talk about, um, Paul C, large professor and Pete Rock. And we're going to talk about more samplers from the late eighties, uh, mid late eighties, uh, early nineties, uh, sampling technique, um, and how like the sampler really became like a musical instrument um, through the, these three producers, um, you know, amongst others, but these primary sort of uh, figures in, in the music. We'll check out some of their music. And yeah, we'll talk about beat making, man. It's like my favorite thing to talk about. Um, as much as rhymes are important, you know, hip hop started with DJs, it started with beats, it started with breaks, you know, and I feel like that gets lost, you know, in these classes and these discussions. So I think, you know, I really want to just bring it back to y'all and give y'all some of the tools to, um, you know, talk about hip hop beats and music and maybe a way that you never thought of or never had the tools uh, to talk about before. And really my goal for like this class is like, you know, you could sit down with someone like me and, you know, a beat head, older head, whatever and you you could have like an informed conversation about hip-hop history beat making djs you know old school rap songs all that stuff and and and, and have the tools to talk about those things have the language have the knowledge you know that's really the goal for this class um because it's all this stuff is setting up 
where we're at right now. And it always will influence the music that you're hearing, no matter what year it is, because it's there, you know, and all these techniques are building up to what people are doing now, um, you know, and always will be, be doing, you know, a modification of what came before. All right, so, uh, yeah, I'll check you. We'll talk about Paul C. and uh, Large Pro, P-Rock, next, next unit. Peace.